Aloha. I'm Marsha Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today's journey is not very far from here. I think it's about 50 miles from here, to be exact. And it is with my dear, dear friend, Bill Isla. And everybody knows I only talk to dear friends. And so Bill is just what, what else can I say? He is now the chair of Hawaiian Homes Plan. I hope I got that right. You did. Bill? You did. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Marsha. Nice talking to you. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, uh, maybe, yeah, I have known Bill for, I don't know how many years. We had a 17 foot boat and we towed it 50 miles out there to. Uh, harbor, boat harbor in Waianae, and he was the, what was it, captain, harbor. chair, somebody, of, harbor uh, master, harbor master, yeah, that's what it was, and so it's been that long since I met Bill, trying to get the boat in the water, and he was just precious, because I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure he got a lot of people in there. That didn't know what they were doing. So since then, we have been very good friends. And so, but today, we, we are going to talk about his newest project, and that is a casino on Hawaiian Homes land. So Bill, you want to tell us about sure. what, what you're doing with the casino, or uh, why, I guess is a real question. Sure. Well, good morning. Let me just give you a, a little bit of a background. Um, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is, is funded by um, the state legislature. Um, we have some trust lands, uh, trust lands that we um, lease to um, commercial operators to make some money for um, uh, application uh, on, uh, on the creation of lots, loans, and um, developing of, of land but it's nowhere near enough. There was a lawsuit filed a couple of years ago. It's called the Nelson lawsuit. Um, in that lawsuit, we prevailed in, the, in terms of um, getting a judge to say that the legislature is supposed to provide sufficient sums to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, for four purposes, lots, loans, um, rehabilitation, and administrative costs. So, um, we have not been successful in getting the uh, correct appropriations or the right amount of appropriations um, in order to remove the 28,000 folks who are sitting on the on the wait list. Our estimate of sufficient sums is somewhere between uh, 150 and 200 million dollars a year. Uh, for the last, I want to say, six or seven years, we've been receiving uh, about 25 million dollars for what they call capital improvement projects, which is um, the uh, grading of lots, bringing in infrastructure, uh, acquiring of lands, um, and then about uh, $18 million for our operating costs, salaries, keeping the lights on, those kinds of things. So there's a vast um, disparity between you know, the, the 25 and 18, and then the 150 and to $200 million. So, um, Earlier this year, my staff got together and they decided, well, what can we do? We're in, a, we're in a, an economic downturn. There's a pandemic going on. What can we do to think outside of the box? And the idea of, uh, of gaming on Hawaiian homelands came up primarily because we looked at other indigenous um, peoples uh, on the continent. And uh, there, you know, I, I believe anywhere between 60 and 70 casinos now um, throughout the United States, um, most of them doing very, very well. There are a few that could stand some improvement. Um, and we did some research into uh, things like, well, what kind of social ills could we expect? Um, got advice from our, our cousins who, who indicated that, you know, based upon 30 years of keeping data uh, on Indian gaming um, as it developed across the United States, that you could, if you put money, put resources up front in enforcement and in 
um, let's say, treatment programs for, for gamblers who are addicted, um, for um, some of the other social ills that are associated with Las Vegas, for example, uh, the sex trafficking, those kinds of things. What would happen in other locales is that you would not see um, any increase in the, the level of crime. So we address that in the bill right up front by making sure that the receipts from the casino would go to um, taking care of these social ills. Um, we came across uh, the simplest way is to seek an exemption from the criminal um, the criminal code that prevents gambling from occurring in Hawaii. So we fashioned the bill, Senate Bill uh, 1321, in such a narrow way that it would give just an exemption to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands for one casino to be operated on commercial lands um, on Oahu. Um, the, the best minds um, regarding like how much how much revenue we could generate from such a, uh, an enterprise uh, indicated that $30 million a year would be a very um, super conservative estimate. And this is after, you know, this would be the department share of the, of the taxes on the gaming receipts. We would also receive uh, separately lease rent from whatever entity that came in and built this uh, resort casino operation. So there'd be two pots of money that would come, come in. Um, there are folks who indicated that, you know, Hawaii is such a close proximity to Asia. There are a lot of Asians who like to gamble that, you know, with the tourism and the addition of a casino in Hawaii on Oahu, um, that number could be much, much higher, um, you know, as high as several hundred million dollars per year. So, the 150 to 200 million dollars that we estimate is necessary for sufficient funds would have been met by the casino revenue, um, and then it would be, uh, you know, in in perpetuity, so to speak. So that's that's how the idea came about. Um, we ran into some flack from our beneficiaries because they felt many of them felt that there should have been more outreach or what they call beneficiary consultation ahead of time. Um, but beneficiary consultation uh, administrative rules talk about when land dispositions are done, that's when you do the beneficiary consultation. This discussion about gaming um, actually came about during a commission meeting when we were discussing legislative matters. And normally we don't do beneficiary consultation during or about legislative manner. So um, that created uh, a, a sort of um, backlash, if you will. And we addressed that by actually holding several meetings statewide. They were, you know, remote meetings through Zoom and Teams, um, but that's the best we can do under these conditions. Well, now, exactly where, is it, where is it located? The uh, bill that was introduced by the legislature actually. No, I meant if, if the legislature says, okay, physically, where would it be located? That was left open uh, anywhere on Oahu that the department had lands that were zoned commercial. And that allowed for the department to go out and acquire additional lands or lands in an area where, let's say, um, it would be more tolerated industrial area or some area not next to a residential area. So that was added to give us more flexibility. Well, um, and the industrial area, would would that be a location? Would that be a sort of location? It would, you know, it, further would, out? it would answer the concerns of many of our beneficiaries who didn't want something that big uh, adjacent to a homestead, you know, because it, it would bring additional traffic and noise. Um, so we, we would look at other areas, perhaps um, closer to the airport, other areas that um, didn't impact residential communities. Um, so all of these, the, the legislation was written in such a way that it would provide the most flexibility in order to make that determination. Now, how is it built if you, 
are there are companies I know that build casinos. Was that what you would do? That they would have to come in and do all of the the building that is necessary. Correct. Uh, it was actually a two prong process. One would be to create a gaming commission that is um, attached to the Hawaiian Homes Commission, but um, not directly under its um, uh, authority, so to speak. Um, and the reason that a gaming commission is so important that we learn from all of our um, gaming um, um, ex experience talking to other folks is that the integrity of the gaming is the most important thing. You want to have a group of people whose job it would be to issue the one license to a gaming company, but there had to be integrity built into that process and transparency so that there would be no question and you would avoid, um, you, you would avoid, you know, the, the bad influence of um, organized um, crime to, to get involved. Then the department through the commission would issue a, a request for a proposal to build such a resort uh, casino establishment. So there's a, there was a two prong process that was uh, attached to this bill. You mentioned resort, but what about, would it be a resort? I mean, not just the casino, but other facilities that to support the casino. Sure. I mean, you you want such a complex because you want to have a hotel that's next to it. You want to have restaurants. You want to have ancillary businesses that are around it um, because uh, it's, you know, when you go to a casino in, in Las Vegas, it's a sort of one-stop shop where everything is available. Um, similar with the uh, Indian, American Indian tribes, they've adopted the, a very similar model um, because it's works, it's effective, and um, you, you do want to sort of capture people, right, your customers to be there and make it convenient for them to be there. So that would add a hotel. It would generate, in our estimation, around 5,000 to 7,000 new jobs. Now, I keep hearing the sound. wonder what that's about. Anyway, uh, what about, I'm sure that Vegas people will object. Or we, have you? Uh, we, we sort of sense their presence uh, in and around the legislature, uh, but not, not openly to, to me or my staff. You know, that's not how lobbyists work. Uh, but I, I, I would just think that that would be the whole thing with, because that's Hawaii. If it wasn't for Hawaii, they wouldn't be as big as they are. Well, there's lots of uh, Hawaiians and, and people from Hawaii and Hawaiians that jump on a plane and fly to Las Vegas. Very yes, regularly. Yes. And, uh, you know, in testimony before the Senate committee, it was really interesting. The Honolulu Police Department testified that on any given day on Oahu, there are between 70 and 100 game rooms that are already operating on a daily basis on Oahu. Mm -hmm. And so if, yes, you take, yes. if you take a conservative... <laughs> If you take a conservative estimate of, let's say the game, the game rooms clear $5,000 per day, that's very conservative, multiply that by 100, and you see that there's half a million dollars in gambling proceeds that are going to these illegal operations. Um, so you can see that people do game, um, that there, oh, is yes. a market, there is a market for it. We were hoping to... Um, establish a legal market for it in which the benefits would go to Native Hawaiians of the Hawaiian Homelands Trust. I'm just wondering how you can guarantee where the, it was the money goes to the state or just to Hawaiian homes? Wow. Actually, the, so the way that the receipts would be considered, there'd be a 45% tax on the gaming, gaming revenue, right? So 55% would stay with the operator, 45% would come to us. Of the 45% that came to us, we would, 80% would be directly 
uh, deposited into uh, a, a trust account. 20% would go to the general fund. Um, of the 20%, 5% would go to the enforcement and um, treatment programs. And then the other 15% would go into the general fund, of course, because there are um, roads and there are um, utilities that would come into the property that um, either the county or the state you know, pays for. So we're looking to pay our fair share. Um, there's an interesting question from someone, one of the viewers that uh, they, there are, they had heard from other folks that you should just give Hawaiians back their lands and not lease it to them. And, um, you know, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act lays out 99 year leases with a opportunity for a hundred year renewal. So that's the way the program was set up. Um, it's not set up to give Native Hawaiians fee simple land. So I just wanted to ask, uh, answer that question. And of course there's 28,000 people that are waiting for uh, a lot and at the current rate of 25 to $30 million a year, we, you know, just a ballpark based upon the cost of infrastructure on Oahu, it's gonna take 180 years at that pace to be able to take care of 28,000 people on the wait list, which is why the idea was hatched. Well, so, but do you have to put in, because now in this federal, uh, was this land federal land? And I know that I, I'm, I'm confused. How much of this is still federal and how much of it was given to you at Hawaiian okay. Homes? So the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, um, after the overthrow and during the territorial period when um, the Republic of Hawaii ceded, right, all the kingdom lands, all the government lands to the U.S. federal government, um, when Congress created the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, it returned, if you will, 204,000 acres to the corpus of this trust that became the Hawaiian Homelands Trust, right, for the purposes of rehabilitating Native Hawaiians who were 50% or more of the blood um, and 18 years or older. So, so what we're talking about now, the the where you, uh, mine homes. That is. So, are you federal employee or state employee? How does that work? Okay. So, as a condition of statehood, say 1959, right? Mm -hmm. State of Hawaii agreed as a condition of statehood, and it's in the Organic Act um, that it would take this federal program called the White Homelands Program, and it created a state department called the State Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Now, as a requirement of becoming a state, the responsibility for the rehabilitation of Native Hawaiians became part of that compact, right? So when everyone voted for a statehood in 1959, they voted to take on this compact and this commitment to Native Hawaiians. And unfortunately, you know, over the years, we have not had sufficient funding to accomplish uh, this compact and this um, commitment. Well, now you're taking airport, for instance, and the harbors. Now, that's income to the state. Do you get any part of that? We do not. In fact, um, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs that was created in uh, the Constitutional Convention of 1978 receives uh, a pro rata share of um, the receipts from ceded land. So that money goes to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Oh, but you do. You don't. We do not. Our lands, um, we would get a percentage of uh, whatever sugar land leases and wa uh, water licenses that were in effect at that time. We would get 30% uh, of those revenues. But over the years, sugar has gone out. Um, 
water leases are up for renewal. It's controversial in the legislature right now. So the amount of revenue that used to come in through those sources has declined significantly. Okay. Now you're going to put people on the land, the houses, whatnot. But now who puts in the water and the electricity and all of those things that have to go with a house? Okay, so the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, through appropriations through the legislature, and we normally get about the, the last five or six years, we get about $20 million in capital improvement funds and $5 million in repair and maintenance funds. That's the money that would go to putting in the roads, the sewers, the water, um, all of the environmental work that would need to be done, any plan and design, um, and then the actual construction to, to make the land available, and then the homeowner actually pays for the vertical construction, right? But we don't charge the, we don't charge the homeowner for the value of that land. And on Oahu, um, it averages to be about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per lot, right? So ten lots is one point five million. A hundred lots is one hundred and fifty million. So you can see twenty five million doesn't go far. No. Well, now, where are those lands? Uh, they, uh, they're on every island, right? They are on every island, uh, including Lanai. Um, we have huge land holdings on the island of Hawaii, um, Maui, um, less land holdings on Oahu and Kauai. Well, what about uh, Molokai, the Parker Ranch? I guess it was Parker Ranch. That's sitting there. Yeah. So Molokai Ranch was the was and continues to be um, one of the largest landowners there. On Molokai, the issue we have large um, land parcels there. The issue is water. Water. Of the course, development course. of water and the delivery of water, both for farming and for residential purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I was just thinking about that ranch that's been for sale for so long. That's Molokai Ranch, and it oh, continues, yes. continues to be for sale. And unfortunately, we have a straw, they have a straw, and the county has a straw in the same aquifer, uh, which is what is limiting our oh, ability oh. to provide water uh, for future development on Molokai. Well, let's let's look back over here. Speaking of water, Nana Kuli. Yes. Yes. Now, I saw on the news you were doing something with the cemetery there. What, tell us about that. Okay, so we have a cemetery that's probably been around since the homesteads opened there in the 19, late, uh, I wanna say late 20s, early 30s. Um, the uh, cemetery started out being managed by churches. Each church had an area. Then as the churches um, left management, uh, there were individual families who cared for it. And here we are today where um, we have records, but they're not complete records of everyone who was buried there. As you know, with the baby boom generation moving through life cycles, we have more and more demands for um, Waianae homesteaders to be, and requests for Waianae, which includes Nana Kuli, homesteaders to be buried there. So. Uh, what you're alluding to is an effort by the department to use technology um, to try to identify either graves that are not marked or lands that are between graves that are not marked that could be used for a burial. So it's really to sort of create an inventory of where um, deceased members or families are and then look at how much land now becomes available for future um, burials. Well, is it, Rick, do you have to be Hawaiian to be buried there? You have to be, or, you have to be Native Hawaiian. You have to ha have to have grown up um, in the Nanakuli Waianae area on homestead so, land. So, so on homestead land. Correct. So it's, it's, well, that's a requirement. It, it is now, because, because, you know, it's, it's homestead land. So it's supposed to be used for small and Native Hawaiians or, you know, uh, they're 25% uh, successors. 
we're encouraging people. There are a lot of people that are being um, cremated nowadays. So we're encouraging people to plan ahead for your family. So I hope it's not too morbid, but um, <laughs> when, when we do um, approve the digging of a new grave, we highly suggest that the first burial go down to 12 feet. And then the second burial is from nine feet and then above that, um, you can put a whole number of urns um, that have to be three feet from the surface. So maximizing the amount of space uh, for the family members uh, of beneficiaries in, in Naraculi and Waina. But it has to be, you have to be on that, the coastline there. That's correct. Well, oh my, Bill, they're telling us we're down to the end of the day. <laughs> So what has happened in the legislature is the House bill uh, was deferred about three weeks ago. And just this past Thursday, the Senate bill 1321 uh, was deferred in the Hawaiian uh, Affairs Committee. So um, for, for all intents and purposes for this legislative session, um, it doesn't seem like it's going to proceed any further because we're in a biennium um, legislature. Of course, the bill is still alive in that committee, it's deferred. And perhaps during the course of um, you know, the year between the legislative sessions, we may be able to share more information because what we've noticed is that as we share information of how the bill came about, what it does, what it doesn't do, um, we've seen the, the opposition go from you know, 80% down to about 50% and the support now come up to about 50%. So once people actually understand what the bill does, how it impacts and benefits Native Hawaiians <clears throat> throughout the state, we find that more people um, turn to support it. And when I say people, I mean you know, beneficiaries. Wonderful. Well. Bill, it's always a pleasure spending time with you. And you must come back and visit with us again. Well, I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to, you know, share information because you get good decisions once you get good information. Well, again, thank you. Aloha. Aloha. And we will see you again. You take care. Aloha.